Welcome to the Middle East Institute uh, at the National University of Singapore and uh, the Italian International Institute for Political Study, ISPI, joint webinar on China in the Middle East. Previously, at MEI, we have been talking about China in the Middle East, uh, looking at the security angle. Uh, at the digital Silk Road uh, and at the friction between China and the United States and how country from Israel to Singapore will have to navigate. Also, we have been discussing extensively on the relationship between Iran and China. Today, I'm very pleased and delighted to have a very distinguished speaker that will address uh, the relationship with China and the Gulf state looking at a different angle. We are not talking about uh, energy security. We are looking at the uh, green economy, health diplomacy, social and religious cooperation, ongoing cooperation, as well as uh, different perspective and a different relationship uh, with countries like Russia, India, in the Middle East. Uh, just uh, a couple of suggestions. We will have uh, only one question to our presenter. So to our audience, please feel free to jump in with your question. You can do it uh, with the Q&A function uh, in the Zoom uh, box, Q&A box, but please make my life easier. Just raise uh, your virtual hand and uh, you can ask the question directly to our speaker. And uh, without further ado, please uh, allow me to introduce you uh, our first speaker, Professor Jonathan Fulton. Uh, Professor Fulton, he is uh, based in Zayed University. He is also a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council, and he's well-known scholar. Uh, he's been written extensively on academic publication and books on China relation in the Middle East. And uh, Jonathan, if I recall correct, uh, you have a book that is ready and is a handbook on China Middle East relation. And starting with your handbook, uh, my question is if you can give uh, a broader picture of China relationship uh, with the Gulf, especially the overlapping part uh, between uh, uh, the Gulf vision and the Belt and Road Initiative. And then after, if you can zoom it down in the area where you are living, that is uh, the Emirate. Uh, Jonathan, the floor is yours. Thanks, Alessandro, for the generous introduction, and thanks uh, for inviting me to this interesting project. You know, to have three distinguished um, organizations come together—it's—it's it's, it's really cool. So, and and also thanks for plugging my book, which you've written a wonderful chapter for as well. Uh, inshallah, we'll see the book by October. It's the Routledge Handbook on China Middle East Relations, and really just a stellar group of scholars who contributed. It's—it's it's something I'm really proud of. Very excited about. So um, I like the theme of this, full steam ahead in the Gulf and looking at trends beyond energy, because I think energy is a really common way of looking at China's relations with Gulf countries. And um, I think it's, it's, it's far too narrow. Obviously, energy uh, has been the foundation. You know, it's what started uh, some of the relations and or at least to, to make them more significant or substantial. Um, certainly, since 2013, that's changed a lot. And you're right to mention the Belt and Road Initiative. I think this is a major facet of what's been going on. Uh, since 2013, when BRI was announced, we've seen a big shift in China's regional policy. Um, and I think this shift recognizes uh, uh, just a fundamental historical fact that the, the Gulf region has always been about more than energy. You know, Long before anybody discovered hydrocarbons here, the Gulf was a, a major transit route. And whether you look at it as part of the Middle East or West Asia, or however you want to designate it, uh, the Gulf links to a lot of really important uh, regions around the world, whether you're going to Africa, to the Mediterranean, or South Asia, or the Indian Ocean region. The Gulf is a major um, region in its own right. And I think what we've seen with the Belt and Road Initiative is a lot of what China's doing in the Middle East uh, is centered here. I think the, the Arabian Peninsula is the anchor of, of China's Middle East ambitions. Um, so it's about more than energy. And of course, like I said, uh, connectivity is I think what the Gulf offers, what the Arabian Peninsula offers for extra regional powers. And connectivity is what the Belt and Road Initiative is all about. 
So when you look at where China is going to be expanding its or deepening its footprint in the Middle East, I think you want to locate those countries that have the most to offer in terms of regional interconnectivity. And that's why um, if, if any of you have seen me on these many, many webinars I've been doing the past, um, well, for the duration of COVID so far, um, there's been a lot of attention paid to the China-Iran relationship, this partnership that's been, uh, I think, exaggerated tremendously uh, over the years. Um, and in March, when China's Foreign Minister Wang Yi uh, made a, a very big visit to the region, he, Iran, and of course they announced that this, this partnership, this comprehensive strategic partnership was, was you know, being signed off on. Um, and this seemed to really get a lot of people nervous. Uh, but what wasn't really noticed, or at least not to the same degree, was the next day he came, Wang Yi, Foreign Minister Wang, came here to Abu Dhabi and announced that the, the, the UAE was going to partner with China in this vaccine manufacturing and distribution project. And I think that was, I think, by far a more uh, interesting part of the story. You know, China and Iran signed this partnership agreement back in January 2016. And it's taken five years to get it off the ground. Uh, China and the UAE signed a similar comprehensive strategic partnership uh, in, in July 2018. And it's already expanded to the point that the UAE has become really, I think, China's most important regional partner. Um, so again, one of the trends I look at going forward, which countries offer the most in terms of regional connectivity? The UAE is by far the most networked country in the Middle East. It's by far the most connected country in the Gulf. It's got this fantastic logistics um, infrastructure. Uh, it, it's really, I think, what, what really we should be looking at rather than getting caught up in the, the potential of a China-Iran relationship, look at the reality of what a, a China-UAE relationship has been. Uh, a second big trend I'd look at is again, looking at the BRI. And I think a lot of analysis on BRI, Belt and Road Initiative, focuses on the infrastructure because it's something that is kind of a sexy story. You know, these massive ports and pipelines and highways and all this stuff that China's building. And of course, I understand that that is very important stuff, but it's only one part. You know, if you look at the, the BRI white paper that was announced in 2015, uh, China announced five cooperation priorities. And the first one was policy coordination. It wasn't infrastructure development, it was policy coordination, working together on issue, uh, political issues of, of shared importance or interests. And again, I think when, when the global economy took this massive COVID-inspired hit, there was a lot of punditry that said, well, that's the end of BRI in, in, in a lot of parts of the world because everybody's economy is so weak. And what you've seen in the Middle East, in the Gulf, and especially in the UAE, is that's not been the case at all. Um, if anything, you've seen that policy coordination element really amp up. And China's been working a lot more closely on things like, as you mentioned, Alessandro, in the introduction, the Digital Silk Road Initiative, in the Health Silk Road Initiative, two of the maybe lesser known components of the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, the Digital Silk Road, the, the DSRI, has been a big part of what China's doing in a lot of Gulf countries, Saudi and the UAE and Qatar, well, Saudi and the UAE primarily. Uh, as those two countries you see in Saudi where they're trying to develop this NEOM project, uh, this new AI-driven city uh, in Dubai, trying to create a smart city that's um, driven by digital economy and, and fintech and AI and all of this stuff that's happening in the region. This lines up very neatly with China's DSRI. So I think that's a big trend to watch is just how are these things going to, to shape the relationship going forward. And again, the UAE I think is, is a very important part of that because you've seen with the vaccine uh, diplomacy, with the projects that the two countries have been cooperating on and distributing the vaccine across the Middle East, uh, it, it does really seem to be where China's footprint is the deepest in the region. And it goes beyond vaccines to the, the components that make it up. So whether it's AI or, or, or digital technologies, all the parts that, that are important in developing this, this um, you know, uh, the, the, the nuts and bolts of, the, of how the vaccine is put together. And I know you're talking about soft power and green, green uh, economies, but I'm a political scientist. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about politics, geopolitics. I think the third trend that I'm looking at, obviously, is you can't really consider China in the Gulf, China in the Middle East, without considering China in the US. And I think Washington and Beijing have both come to this conclusion that great power competition is defining um, their relationship at this point. And I think in many regions in, around the world, 
uh, the China-US relationship seems to be inherently competitive. Um, but the Gulf doesn't necessarily, that's not necessarily the case. There are a lot of policy areas where there is room for policy coordination, where the two sides don't necessarily bump up against each other. They, they seem to have a lot of interests in common. So if you talk to folks around the Gulf, nobody is really interested in being a theater of great power competition. You see a lot of countries or a lot of leaders that want to try to maintain a balanced approach to, to cooperate with both the US and China. How sustainable or possible that is in the future, it's hard to say because I think, again, a lot of, a lot of this gets decided in Beijing and, and, and Washington. Um, but I do think that there's still an opportunity for these two sides to, to work together uh, in the Gulf uh, to try to achieve a more uh, stable region. So I'll stop here. Um, I know there's a lot of, going to be a lot of discussion. Uh, so again, just thanks for the opportunity to join you today and look forward to any questions. And I can discuss issues like China's soft power in the Gulf uh, if, if that comes up in the discussion period. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Uh, uh, of course, you, you roped in uh, the, the elephant in the room, great power competition. Uh, if we look at the great power competition, for example, Chinese soft power in some area of the world uh, has been uh, questioned several times. And even we, we are still debating if you can use night definition for Chinese soft power, while most of the time it is, is being considered hard power used softly. But this gives me the opportunity to introduce our second uh, speaker, that is Dr. Jacqueline Armijo. She currently based in, uh, in Shanghai as a visiting professor at the U New York University Shanghai campus. She's a scholar of Islam in China, and uh, she has taught uh, uh, in very prestigious university from Cornell, Stanford, and uh, in your university also, Jonathan, in Zayed University in, in UAE. She's been in Qatar University and Asian University for Women in Bangladesh, as she's been living more than a decade in, in the Gulf. And as today we are focusing on China relation in the Gulf, I want to start to ask uh, to Jacqueline a first question about uh, Chinese uh, uh, footprint uh, in the education uh, and in the cultural relation uh, in the area, in the region. And of course, uh, if you can look uh, at the growing role of Chinese Muslim diaspora, especially in the UAE, floor is yours, Jacqueline. Thank you. And I'd like to start by sharing my screen. If that hasn't worked, let me know. It's working. Okay. I'm going to begin by quickly reviewing the early trade between China and the Gulf and some of the long-term cultural impacts. I will then describe an extraordinary and massive art exhibit that took place in Qatar that built on these early ties. The next topic will be a recent major initiative to introduce Chinese language instruction in primary and secondary schools across the UAE, and more recently a similar but smaller scale one in Saudi and how this is part of China's huge education and research soft power projects related to the Belt and Road Initiative. Finally, there'll be a brief discussion of the role of Dubai's Chinese Muslim community in facilitating China-UAE economic relations and cultural context. So as a historian, I'd like to start with a bit of history. Um, it, it was not until about 20 years ago that um, scholars realized the extent to which China had this massive trade with countries um, of the Middle East and especially the Gulf. It was when a people based in Singapore know um, about the Bailey Tong shipwreck. But in this boat that was originally had built in Oman and was heading back to the Middle East after picking up about 70,000 goods in, um, in Guangzhou in, in China, it sank um, off the coast of Indonesia. When it was recovered, it was realized that they had just literally um, tens of thousands of objects that had been created in kilns across China that were custom made for different markets um, in the Middle East and the Gulf. Among the many fascinating components of this discovery was the fact that although people equate the famous Chinese blue and white porcelain with the later periods, especially the Ming Dynasty, um, this boat's in the early ninth century. And this is one of the earliest known examples of um, blue and white Chinese porcelain. And as um, so some of you may know, the blue um, is, is from Iran. It's cobalt that has to be imported from Iran. 
So one of the reasons I wanted to mention this was just to give um, the audience an idea of just how early there were Muslims primarily traveling back and forth um, between the Gulf and China and the extent to which this trade had become quite developed by the beginning of the ninth century. Um, this was, this is an example of the Dao, the Omani boat that, um, that held all of the objects. Although uh, traders originally settled in Guangzhou on the coast, um, later there was a much larger um, community based in Tranzhou. This is the mosque in Tranzhou. This, this uh, mosque is known as the De Tingting, Tingtong in Chinese and Al-Asab Mosque in, in Arabic. And it was built around 1080. And this is the, I, I was just, as you can see from the mask, I was just, I was there fairly recently. And this is what's left. The, um, muse, this is basically now a small museum of what's remaining from this mosque. They, they, they moved a traditional Chinese mosque to right next to um, the old one. And for those of you who have not seen a traditional Chinese mosque, this is the interior. And those of you um, who are native speakers of Arabic will realize that there's this very, very highly stylized form of Arabic that's developed in, in China over the centuries. And just in passing, um, most the, there's officially 10 Chinese Muslim communities. Um, the largest are Hawaii and their descendants primarily of traders who came from the Middle East and Central Asia and first settled in China um, primarily um, during the Yuan Dynasty. So this, although I visited this, um, this mosque first back in 1981 when it was, it was in ruins and there was no museum next door, I visited a few months ago. And right next to the mosque, the uh, Sultan Qaboos of Oman has um, financed a, a brand new mosque, which is really quite elegant. And at this point, only used on Friday prayers. One of the things that, another reason I wanted to mention Tranjo in particular was to this day in Tranjo, there are still remnants of traditional Islamic architecture um, throughout um, the old parts of the city. These are examples of some of the tombstones um, that were from the very large Muslim community that had settled in Tranjo. I'm now going to switch to, oh, and this gives you an idea of um, the different parts of the Muslim world that these Muslim traders had, had come from. So I'm now gonna talk about a project carried out by Zai Guoqiao, uh, one of China's most famous um, artists. When uh, Sheikh Mayasa in Qatar decided to have the first solo exhibit back around 2012, she invited Zai Guoqiao. And what she hadn't realized is that in fact, he was the perfect person to have this first exhibit. Although he's not Muslim, he grew up in Tranjo and has since uh, since he was a child, he understood the importance of the history of Islam in China, and he incorporated it into his work. One of the things that he did was he had, sorry, um, he had um, local artisans in Tranjo carve into boulders the epitaphs from these tombstones of the Muslims onto these large boulders, and then he shipped the boulders um, to Doha. So these are the entrance of the museum. Um, this is one of, these are close-ups of some of the examples. Another part of the exhibit as you first enter it are these three boats. One's Chinese, uh, one's a Gulf fishing boat, and um, the others are sort of in between. But he very much wanted to recreate the sense of traveling from across the oceans, um, from China to the Gulf. One of, he, he does, he's known for working with gunpowder as, as a media. So the first thing he does is he creates this giant stencil and then he has hundreds of volunteers sort of cut it out. And then it, um, there's different types of gunpowder he puts on top. The whole thing is covered, it's lit, it's ignited. And it's um, basically the images are burned into the text. This is the final example we added. Um, some more detail and some notes. And as you can see, here's the traditional um, Dao and here's a traditional Chinese trading vessel. 
there were several extremely large um, paintings as part of this project, but this is the one that was, I think, most liked by um, the variety of people I interviewed who went to this exhibit. And it was called 99 Horses. And it's, it's both stunningly beautiful, but also by calling it um, Jojo, Jojo Ma in, in, um, in Chinese, 99 has this idea of infinity. And of course in Arabic, it sort of re is resonant of the 99 names of God. One of the reasons I wanted to start with that exhibit is because China is now spending a lot of time promoting heritage and different forms of heritage culture and this whole idea of the historic Silk Route. But what's so interesting is what Zai Guoqiang did. He did this well before China had developed this plan. And he also did it in a way that, you know, both Qataris and other Gulf Arabs who traveled to the region were very, very much struck by it. I had students at the time who did a lot of interviews with some of the guests. And it was so interesting for, you know, the Gulf Arabs as they entered this exhibit to really stop and, and ponder what it must have been like hundreds of years ago for traders from that region to go and settle in China and, and, and then some of them passed away in China. He also did several ceremonies in which he sort of welcomed the souls of the ones who died overseas back home to the Gulf. So the other initiative I wanted to talk about um, started fairly recently. It was first uh, announced in 2017. And that is there are now plans for, well, it's already started. Chinese is now being taught in primary and secondary schools across the UAE at about a hundred. And they started in 2017 with, I think, 10 schools or 11 schools. And now it's up to 100. Clearly, things have been sort of been put on hold, although I think the classes are continuing, but obviously online right now. And I don't know um, at this point to what extent they're going to be able to expand it over the next couple of years. But as you can see, they already have a textbook. And so far, it's, it's going really well. But one of the reasons I wanted to mention this is because in other countries, China's been in several around the world, and there's, there's several in the Gulf regions, and there's two in the UAE. But in other countries, what China is doing is they are giving scholarships for local students to go and study Chinese in China and to get a degree program, and then they go back to their home country and start teaching primary and secondary school students. Whereas in the Gulf, specifically the UAE, China is investing a lot of their very, very you know, sought after Chinese language teachers specifically to the UAE to be able to offer Chinese language programs. Um, Saudi, Saudi has also started something similar, um, but on a much smaller basis. But one of the interesting things Saudi is working on specifically in terms of cultural um, historical ties is they are doing joint archeological um, projects. Among other things, they are looking for similar uh, shipwrecks as was found in Belitung off of the coast of Indonesia. And this is an article about one of the projects which did find some things in, along a Red Sea port. And as Jonathan mentioned, China very, you know, very early on made it very clear that there were many different dimensions of the Belt, Belt and Road initiatives. And I think, um, for example, Section 5, the cooperation mechanisms, people to people bond, was pretty much looked over by a lot of people. But it says very clearly they're about academic exchanges, personal exchanges, um, schools, scholarships, you know, media, cultural heritage, et cetera. And one of the things I thought was interesting is that they also said from the very beginning, um, focus on epidemic information sharing and the scientific and technology exchange. Um, for those specifically interested in, in China and science and the, and the role of BRI, there was an excellent series of articles written in Nature specifically on, on this. But one of the things that points out was just the degree to which China has literally gone around, certainly the certainly around most of Asia, they've sent scientists um, and, and, and public health officials to different, to different countries. They've literally tried to figure out what their biggest need was. Then identified scientists and, and uh, research scholars in China who had those skills, set up research centers in the country with, with the need, you know, sent you know, professors to do trainings, sent local you know, scientists to China for extensive training, 
they're building a foundation in terms of education and scientific research that theoretically can have extraordinary long-term impacts. And they're very much thinking in a, in a, in a absolute in a long term. Some of you may know both China and, for example, the UAE and Saudi, and to a certain extent, Qatar have invested a huge amount in renewable energy. Um, this is an interesting example of um, sustainable uh, food sources. So this is a project in which um, Dubai and the Qingdao Saline Alkaline Tolerant Rice Research set up a a test to see whether or not they could they could grow um, saltwater rice, and they basically were successful. I want to conclude with mention of um, China's the very large Chinese population in Dubai, which now is over a quarter of a million, and the role of the Chinese Muslim community. So this is the mosque that they opened a couple of years ago. Um, they've called it the you know Fafang Qingzhengzi, which is the Chinese community mosque. And um, this is the Chinese Islamic Culture Center they have there, which works very hard at facilitating all sorts of um, cooperation between um, Emiratis and Chinese. I think I'll end there. Oh, actually. Thank you very much, Jacqueline. Uh, it was uh, extremely interesting, uh, especially the fact that, that you as Jonathan underlined the role of connectivity. Historically speaking, uh, you mentioned it correctly that uh, blue and white porcelain are very famous, especially in, uh, in the West now. But at the time, uh, Ming Dynasty and Qin Dynasty, the Chinese still prefer uh, song style celadon compared to the blue and white that was just an export product uh, primarily for Persia. And then it moved on with Portugal and uh, with uh, the Dutch, uh, with the Kraken uh, in, uh, into Europe. Uh, and this gave me the opportunity to introduce our third speaker, looking at interaction that is not only related to China and the Gulf, but also to other uh, regional power in the area. Our third speaker is a research fellow for the Mr. Lead Policy and the International Institute of Strategic Study, Hassan al -Hassan. He specializes in analyzing foreign and economic relations in Asia and the Middle East. And uh, he is uh, completing his doctoral research thesis at the King's College London, looking at the decision-making process behind the India foreign policy throughout the Gulf. So this gave me the occasion, Hassan, to ask you if uh, the friction between the China and the United States in the Gulf uh, is having other effect on other regional power, and uh, what is especially the role in this of India and even if we can rope in Russia. Hassan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Alex, for the uh, generous introduction. Um, um, and uh, it's a pleasure to be on this uh, wonderful panel. We're clearly covering a number of very important uh, topics. Uh, and I think your question alludes to uh, something that's uh, um, often quite missing in the debate on the Chinese role uh, in the region and in the Middle East, which is uh, uh, to uh, contextualize uh, uh, the Chinese role and the Chinese footprint uh, um, uh, in, in, in more than one way. Uh, I think one of the, one of, one of the key problematic um, areas or aspects of the, of the, for example, the media coverage and uh, much of the commentary uh, uh, around uh, Chinese presence in the, in the region because of the politicization of this and the, and the I think, uh, 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 tendency to securitize everything that China does in the region, and to view it through primarily a, uh, uh, as, a as a threatening actor, uh, especially in the West. Uh, I think uh, we have a tendency to look at what China does uh, uh, with a very myopic, uh, so for me, myopic perspective. Uh, and therefore, we often tend not to contextualize it against what other external players uh, are doing in the Gulf region. Uh, or to look at how uh, it fits into the strategies uh, of the regional uh, uh, actors in the Gulf uh, uh, itself. Um, and so what I'll, what I'll start by doing is to, is to try to bring China's uh, uh, economic and security footprint to the Gulf region, put it into comparative perspective against uh, that of other external players uh, um, on the one hand, and then on the, un on the other hand, try to look at how um, um, uh, China-Gulf relations fit into the broader overarching 
national security objectives of the Gulf states, uh, and more specifically on the Arab Gulf states uh, uh, and the GCC uh, member states. So to begin, I think, by uh, contextualizing and comparing uh, China's uh, economic footprint uh, against that of other extra regional powers. So it's no surprise that um, uh, as a, uh, from a trade perspective, of course, China surpasses uh, uh, the rest of the Asian powers and, and, and the rest of the world in terms of being uh, um, uh, uh, the Gulf states uh, or the Gulf region's most important trading partner uh, with trade, uh, uh, um, I think reaching at about $180 billion uh, more or less. Uh, now, of course, so, so China is, of course, uh, the region's most important uh, trading partner as a, as a state, uh, but it's not extremely far off by comparison to other uh, Asian players. So, for example, uh, uh, Gulf uh, trade with India stands at uh, at over $100 billion. Uh, so it's, it's not that very far off. Um, uh, Chinese energy imports, for example, from the GCC, from the GCC states are uh, obviously very important as well. But again, they're uh, uh, more or less comparable to those of India, uh, Japan, and uh, South Korea. I think where the picture uh, starts to shift a little bit is when we look at um, uh, trends in FDI, so that's foreign direct investment and lending. Uh, and here, China is even less exceptional uh, in quantitative terms by comparison to uh, other external powers. Uh, so to begin with, I mean, the Middle East is a minor recipient of and not just the Gulf region, but even the, the broader Middle East is a minor recipient of uh, Chinese investments. Uh, so, of course, the major caveat is that it's, it's not easy to obtain data uh, on uh, reliable data on Chinese uh, uh, foreign investments and Chinese lending, uh, especially in the Middle East. You have what I call a, a double transparency uh, deficit. So China's not on the, on the sending end. China's not very uh, transparent. And, and on the receiving end, Middle Eastern countries uh, don't tend to be very transparent either. Uh, so, so that creates a, a, a data problem. Uh, but even if we were to believe the data that's out there, the data that's re uh, reported by the UN Conference on Trade and, and, and Development, for example, um, Chinese, uh, uh, the Middle East is, is a minor recipient of Chinese investments. Um, uh, I think China's FDI stock in the, in the Middle Eastern region stands at around uh, $25 billion, uh, uh, according to 2018. Uh, figures and that's that's about 1.3 percent of China's total outward FDI, and it's it's quite a minor figure uh, uh, when uh, you look at uh, uh, the Middle East's share of uh, global FDI, which stands at 3.7 percent. So compared to the global average, actually China uh, uh, is a uh, is a fairly minor investor uh, uh, in in the region. It invests less than than uh, uh, what the region gets in in, in terms of the world's total uh, outward FDI. Uh, the Middle East is also a minor recipient of Chinese lending and of Chinese credit. Um, so um, China's debt stock in the nine Middle Eastern countries for which data is available uh, only represents uh, about 0.2% uh, uh, of their total GDP. Uh, by comparison, uh, uh, China, uh, 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 China's share of global debt stock was the equivalent of, of about 6% of the world's GDP. Uh, so in essence, what that means is that the Middle East is a, is a low priority region uh, for Chinese outward lending by comparison to, to the rest of the world. Um, so on the one hand, the Middle East is a, uh, is a low priority uh, um, destination for Chinese investments and for Chinese lending. On the other hand, um, China faces stiff competition as an investor uh, and as a source of credit in the Middle Eastern region when we look at what other external players are doing. Uh, and so, for example, in, in 2018, uh, China's share of uh, the Middle Eastern region's inward FDI stock, so sort of all of the, the stock of investments in the Middle Eastern region, stood at, China's share stood at around uh, 2%, uh, which is uh, uh, ironically, was this was uh, had it changed? I mean, so China's share stood at two percent even prior to the BRI, uh, prior to uh, its launch in, in twenty twelve. Uh, and so the BRI, if we were to go by uh, UN figures, 
does not appear to have had a, um, uh, a quantitative impact on uh, uh, China's share of uh, uh, total investments in the region. So China is, is far outweighed, for example, as an investor by global and regional competitors, including the EU, especially uh, uh, by, by multiple orders of magnitude, the US uh, and the GCC as well. Um, that being said, uh, the Gulf states, of course, and coming back to the Gulf region, uh, the Gulf states are the most uh, uh, important recipients of Chinese investments uh, in the Middle East. Uh, and so Chinese investments tend to be concentrated in the UAE. And that's, of course, normal, uh, 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 given that the UAE captures the overwhelming majority of foreign direct investment in the Middle East anyway. So it's not, it's not China is not exceptional in that regard. Uh, it's, it's, it's following uh, merely following the regional trend. And so, of course, the UAE is the, is the, more, is the most important uh, recipient of Chinese investments, followed by Israel, uh, and then, of course, Saudi Arabia and, and Turkey as well. Uh, but there are a few other countries that generally face economic difficulties and sanctions, such as Iran, Algeria, uh, and to a lesser extent, Egypt, that are also important recipients. Uh, that being said, and I think despite all the talk about China's investments in renewable energy, in uh, 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 digital infrastructure, and in ports and logistics and so on, the majority of Chinese investments and contracts in the region, uh, according to AEI data, uh, is still concentrated in the energy sector and is still concentrated more specifically in the hydrocarbon sector. So that continues to be, from a quantitative perspective, I think, uh, the main um, uh, area of focus for Chinese investments. The thing is, is that I think the reason why Chinese investments in the region tend to um, attract a lot of attention is because of their qualitative nature uh, and because of the fear that China's edge in emerging uh, sectors and emerging technologies um, uh, might end up eroding uh, the US's and the West's uh, 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 North American, uh, uh, Western European uh, powers or, or actors, global leadership uh, in these areas. So for example, uh, uh, China is emerging, of course, as an important partner for uh, uh, Gulf states uh, uh, and the areas and sectors of renewable energy, of course, under the umbrella in, in digital uh, technology and infrastructure uh, under the umbrella of the Digital Silk Road uh, in logistics and uh, increasingly in public health and, and biotechnology. So I think the, 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 the qualitative nature, of course, is, is very worrying generally for Western policy makers. But from a quantitative perspective, China is not taking over the Middle East, uh, uh, let alone the Gulf region uh, anytime soon. Um, I think the second uh, way in which it would be important to contextualize um, China's activity and behavior in the region is, is from a security perspective. Um, and I think there, uh, it's fair to say that even by comparison to, to Asian players, China is a, is a fairly late comer. Uh, and so, yes, China's joint exercises with Russia and Iran uh, uh, on the one hand and with Saudi Arabia on the other received a lot of attention, uh, but Japan's maritime presence in the, in the Gulf region uh, uh, um, uh, uh, far uh, uh, outweighs that of China. Ch Japan, for example, is part of the combined maritime forces. It's part of the, 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 the combined task force 150, which looks at maritime security outside of the Gulf. It's part of CTF 151 that, that looks at uh, counter piracy uh, missions and operations uh, under a, a US umbrella. Uh, and so Japan has been part of the maritime uh, 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 security architecture of the region uh, uh, for a very long time. India as well has, had, uh, has long had privileged security relations with Oman, for example. It enjoys berthing privileges in Omani ports. Um, it's uh, Indian uh, uh, security uh, wonks often talk about a secretive agreement that India had signed with Qatar uh, 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 more than a decade ago that stops just short of deploying Indian troops uh, uh, to Qatar. There's uh, uh, um, vigorous counterterrorism cooperation with the UAE and, and Saudi Arabia uh, and a, an uptick in Indian defense diplomacy. We've, we've recently seen the Indian chief of uh, armed forces uh, visit Saudi Arabia for the first time uh, and, see, and have seen Indian uh, um, uh, uh, armed forces conducting uh, combined exercises with their Gulf counterparts 
Uh, India has deployed naval assets to protect Indian tankers uh, crossing the Strait of Hormuz following the uh, uh, Iranian attacks on uh, shipping in the region. And so the, the point, the takeaway here is that, yes, uh, there is an increase in, in, in Chinese defense diplomacy and joint exercises and so on. But when compared even to, to other Asian actors, China is a relative latecomer to the region. Um, I think the final uh, uh, contextualization, I think, uh, uh, part of the contextualization exercise is to look at how relations with China fit into the GCC perspective. And I'll be quite brief here. Uh, I think it's important to keep in mind that uh, uh, from the GCC state's perspective, and I think it makes sense to speak about the GCC as a block in this regard, because I think that there is a shared uh, a threat perception and a, th a shared perception about Gulf regional security, especially vis-a-vis -vis Iran. Uh, I think the overarching national security objectives for the GCC states uh, is one, uh, uh, um, to internationalize Gulf regional security uh, and to create a Gulf regional security architecture that is extremely penetrated by international actors. And I think that has become extremely pronounced uh, uh, or increasingly pronounced, let's say, after the 1990 Iraqi invasion of Iraq, uh, of Kuwait and the 1991 uh, Gulf War. So since then, we've seen every single GCC country host foreign troops, be they uh, uh, American, British, French, uh, or over the past few years, uh, Turkish troops in, in Qatar. Um, this is primarily a way of countering Iran's hegemonic potential in the region, but also allowing uh, the smaller Gulf states a greater degree of strategic autonomy vis-a-vis -vis other uh, regional players as well. I think the second uh, 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 component of the GCC state strategy is, a, is diversifying their foreign relations and creating these overlapping webs uh, of strategic, strategic partnerships. Uh, and we've seen that, for example, so 2006 is, is, is a landmark year. We've seen King Abdullah at the time uh, uh, conduct his maiden visits to China and then to India. And I think since then we've seen a, and, and, and probably before that, since the end of the 1990s really, We've seen a, a heated attempt by, a feverish attempt by the Gulf states to diversify their foreign relations. Uh, and third, to uh, uh, guarantee for themselves a degree of strategic autonomy, both from the US, but from other uh, regional players as well. And here, China makes sense as a partner. From the GCC state's perspective, uh, uh, it's a great power, one that has leverage on Iran, and one that allows the GCC states to hedge against U.S. disengagement uh, in the short and medium term uh, and uh, U.S. decline uh, in the long term. So uh, it makes sense as a partner that allows them, uh, that allows the GCC states a greater room uh, and greater margin of autonomy vis-a-vis -vis great and, and regional powers. Uh, and I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hassan. Uh, definitely, I'm going to steal your definition of double transparency deficit. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, uh, GCC country, uh, compared to other regions in the world, uh, are a minor recipient of Chinese uh, FDI. As we have been talking uh, uh, about present uh, and in the past uh, with Jacqueline, uh, I would like, like to try to gaze at the crystal ball and look in what are the trend in the near future of China present in GCC, especially looking at green economy, at health diplomacy, uh, with UAE having approved the production of Chinese vaccine, for example, in the Emirates. And uh, this gave me the opportunity to introduce uh, our next speaker, Alessia Migini. Uh, prior to introduce Alessia, I would like to personally thank Alessia for making it possible the cooperation between MEI and ISPI and also I will take the chance uh, to thank my colleague, Dr. Clemens Che, uh, for working very hard in making this event possible. Dr. Alessia Migini is a co-head of Asian Center and Senior Associate Research Fellow at the Italian Institute for International Political Study, better known as ISPI. She is also an Associate Professor of Economics in the University of Piemonte Orientale, and she previously worked as Associate Economist at the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development in Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, I will use, uh, uh, as I did with Jonathan, the excuse of your book, uh, as Alessia, you just published a book, Money and Might Along the Belt and Road. And uh, using what 
you found in this book uh, uh, related to green economy, uh, health diplomacy, uh, can you tell us what are going to be the trend of China in road in the GCC, in the, uh, in the Gulf? Uh, and uh, I don't know if I can ask you this question, if it's already there, but there's been a lot of talk uh, about Chinese digital UN. It's too early, it's too premature to talk about digital UN in road uh, in the Gulf and then in the Middle East. Floor is yours, Alessia. Thanks, Alessandro, for this introduction and also for organizing this um, seminar, this event, which I think is very timely because uh, although I agree with the previous speakers, of course, uh, which were contradictory a little bit with each other, Jonathan and Hassan, uh, told that, of course, China is growing its presence in the Middle East, in the GCC or Middle East, uh, broadly speaking, but uh, it is still a latecomer. Uh, so it's a little bit contradictory. So I would like to uh, share with you some points uh, taken from my uh, own research and from uh, my own study about China uh, in various regions in the world, including the Middle East. Um, uh, which I think uh, is becoming the very area where all the various belts and roads are uh, finding their own way, uh, I mean, in a comprehensive way, um, unlike in other regions where the belt and road has been developing, so Africa, Southeast Asia, or Latin America as well, or elsewhere in Central Asia. So I think the Middle East is becoming, maybe it's not yet fully developed, but is becoming the region where all the various um, channels uh, within the Belt and Road are developing. And of course, also um, Jacqueline said that Belt and Road is not only infrastructure. And uh, I think this is very bizarre why the, especially in Europe, but also the Western countries have taken Belt and Road as being only transport infrastructure for so many years now that it's really um, unbelievable that uh, all the other four pillars at least of Belt and Road have been neglected almost totally. While in China, since 2014, maybe not, maybe not 2013, but 2014, 2015, the digital Silk Road, the L Silk Road were uh, at the center of the debate. Um, so this is very peculiar that, you know, there are so um, many misperceptions about what the Belt and Road is, uh, which is a lot of things. And what I would like to um, mention today, first of all, is that Belt and Road is not dying. It's not dead. You may have remembered um, a short uh, but very shocking debate some months ago, earlier this year, uh, saying from one Financial Times article that Belt and Road was actually phasing out because of the pandemic, because of the uh, changes in you know foreign policies and and the money given to finance Belt and Road projects, but that that view was totally biased because Belt and Road is again not just transport roads railways uh, shipping and logistics but it's a lot of things and these other many things are growing and they are growing a lot um, and especially I would focus on um three uh, areas where the the Belton road you know action is developing quite fast and once it has already been mentioned which is energy uh or green i mean renewable energy sector which was in 2020 the single most uh important sector as a recipient of Belton road uh, investment uh, I mean, in the middle of the pandemic, the Bentley Road was going still, and the very sector that was targeted for investments were uh, was, you know, were renewable sectors. And the Middle East, especially some of the countries, of course, here, not all of them, were targeted for this. Um, this is very important because it has to be contextualized into the long-standing um efforts by some of these countries especially uh 
um, United Arab Emirates, but also Saudi Arabia, they have been in place um, industrial development policy strategies for so many years to diversify their own economy. And renewable sectors were, of course, one of the sectors they started to look at to, uh, to diversify their production structure. And so this, um, you know, um, creates a complementarity with China's interest in improving renewable sectors and in investing in renewable sectors. And this has been very neglected, uh, I think. So I agree with Hassan that it's still, you know, developing, but it's going to be a major avenue for really win-win. I mean, not the Chinese way, but really on, in the field, the win-win uh, benefits for uh, for this sector and for the area. Uh, so I both agree with Jonathan and but also with Azan because this has been very important. Although maybe in aggregate term is still you know minor percentage, but in sectoral term is very relevant. And here you see also that many other countries have been included in this action of renewable energy uh, investment. Uh, of course, there are different uh, levels of, you know, inclusion and interaction. There are priority partners for Belt and Road investment, uh, both at the bilateral level, which is the, um, you know, largely uh, uh, preferred by China, but also within so-called comprehensive partnerships, uh, meaning a group of countries, many groups of countries where um some projects are you know uh, shared and are uh, developing and if you have a look at the map of course it's not only the gulf or the middle east but it is a major part of the world which uh, is being in beijing's eyes uh targeted as a whole and this bear with me, I will take it up again in a minute, because I think this is very rele relevant to understand the narrative that China is giving uh, to the rest of the world in terms of uh, their you know, areas of uh, foreign policy actions and the motivation for these foreign policy actions. The, the second you know, area pillar of Belt and Road, although it's not one of the five major pillars included in the White Book back in 2015, it's one of the minor pillars, but very relevant because, you know, back in 2015, when the White Book was published, of course, the L Street Road was there already. I remember in the, during the first Belt and Road Forum in Beijing, there was a memorandum of understanding between the World Health Organization and the People's Republic of China for health cooperation along the Belt and Road. And nobody even dared to ask what this could become, you know. Then, you know, last year we understood that that could be a way to also, you know, develop soft power around the world. And we all saw how many channels, how many medical equipment and vaccine and medical doctors uh, going to many of these countries to help. Um, but the, the health belt and road was already there. And in the spirit and in the intention of, uh, of China, of course, it was much intended to help African countries, um, which are much in need of health cooperation, besides development cooperation uh, to core. Um, and, uh, of course, China has a lot of interest, I mean, uh, economic interest in, in Africa and wanted to also uh, start this uh, health cooperation, which now is, you know, worldwide. Uh, I mean, it was a, a tool of soft power, un, uh, I mean, unintended tool of soft power all over the world, and now we see how many countries have been included. So. This Elf Silk Road has been a major uh, pillar and avenue of diplomacy, uh, political diplomacy, as you know, we are witnessing how many countries are queuing for uh, either vaccine or, or other kinds of equipment. Uh, and this is a major uh, you know, vehicle for exerting soft power also in other areas. And this is mainly true I dare say for South America these very days, but it's in general is 
uh, very effective uh, all over the place. Uh, this is another map. I mean, it's not very easy to find information, especially mapped information about these kinds of uh, Belt and Road avenues and pillars, but uh, these are some of them. Uh, so I may share with you, it's not mine, of course, it's from many other institutions around the world that have been gathering information on this. Um, it's not impossible to find, but it's tricky. Um, so the third uh, avenue of cooperation, the, it's not a very recent one, but it's, it's the most neglected, is uh, the digital cum financial <laughs> pillar, I would say. Um, we know that the internet will shape everything industry, manufacturing, transport, um, hospitals, um, any kind of sector will be impacted by how much internet, how which kind of internet and uh, uh, which level of internet connectivity uh, this sector will have. And China is very much aware of this. And um, she has been building the digital Silk road Again, uh, originally nobody dared about because uh, to, to talk about it because it seemed to be only the Huawei story. But the Huawei story is just uh, physical infrastructure, physical internet infrastructure, um, mostly. And uh, it's been, I mean, in our view, it has been segmented. Instead, it's part of a big picture of digital connectivity, which also includes finance and currency. So uh, I am aware of this picture not being very sexy, not being very informative, but uh, this is uh, you know, a, a net uh, of central bank notes uh, that is being put in place within what it's called a bridge, um, you know, multilateral currency, uh, central bank um, digital currency bridge which exactly has uh, one uh, Middle Eastern country participating in United Arab Emirates, uh, together with Thailand and uh, with the supervision of the Bank for International Settlements, uh, not least, um, to start using the new, uh, newly born um, uh, electronic RMB cross-border for cross-border payments, despite the vice central uh, governor of the People's Bank of China saying some weeks ago that the ERMB is not going to be used for cross-border payments. It is going to be used. It is already being experimented in a pilot uh, bridge uh, dedicated to this. And uh, one of these countries is the United Arab Emirates. So again, uh, which is, uh, let me say, much more relevant in terms of financial linkages than the other country participating in the bridge pilot project, uh, namely Thailand, because of course the, the, the much larger flows uh, of resources that uh, flow from China to United Arab Emirates and back uh, compared to those from and back to Thailand. So um, the pilot is going to test whether ERMB can be used for international transactions. And of course, this is very much connected to the digital Silk Road because the payments will be digitalized as well with the ERMB. And the countries that will have been partnering with China also on the digital Silk Road will be much ahead of time in this you know, new uh, adventure with China. So um, this, I realize this digital uh, Silk Road is very, not very fascinating. I mean, it's very technical, it's very complicated. It's banking, finance, and in, uh, inf information technology altogether, which I mean, none of them is very you know, uh, reader friendly for non um, specialists. Uh, but altogether, these three uh, 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 sectors, are joining forces to build something that we cannot tell about yet, because it seems that China wants to build a kind of a digital realm, um, including many countries in the world, uh, not just 
neighboring countries, such as Indonesia, which is one of the most you know, near to in, being included into this um, digital uh, projects, but also United Arab, Arab Emirates, uh, for example. Not only, but you know, already officially included in the pilot. Um, this, I think, opens um, at least uh, an expectation of um, a potential digital area, uh, cross-border, where internet regulation, e-commerce regulation, and the digital sector regulation uh, will be shared, and which will likely to be segmented from other areas where other rules are being will be applied to either e-commerce or digital sector or internet. And I'm I mean, think that the world is should not be hoping for a segmented internet because internet is a, exactly um, beneficial for everybody because it's, I mean, it's free and it's interoperable. The very day we will have different internets, then that will be a very, very gloomy day, I think. So I think the scenario cannot be built, but we have two options at least. One is for a free internet, and the other is for a segmented internet. And finance will be included into this because finance will be digitalized. And so we go through the usual avenues through that our mobiles are bearing with them. So all the connections. Um, and so, oh, sorry, uh, um, Alex, for not giving you a scenario, but we have two major scenarios. We are think on a, a very, crucial moment where the world, the international financial governance people and fora uh, should be very much aware that we are now uh, at the very juncture, very crucial juncture for this. Um, but let me um, end my couple of minutes with um, a comment going back to what I was saying before. Um, after Africa and Southeast Asia, the Middle East, I believe, is becoming the area where all the Belt and Roads are being developed or, and in a very comprehensive way. Um, I think uh, uh, in the spring, in it is a spring tour in six countries in the area, foreign, Chinese Foreign Ministry Wang Yi uh, mentioned um, and was also very much commented upon that uh, very statement um, that um, you know uh, China is uh, very much aware of the area because of course uh, she was still helping uh, developing countries to develop their much needed infrastructure and this is very peculiar indeed because the area we are talking about is not a developing area. So being a developing economist working on Asia and in, on China working in developing countries, I was kind of shocked hearing not just foreign minister, Mr. Foreign Minister, but also commentators saying that this developing area needs a lot of development cooperation because of course Saudi Arabia is not the low income country, uh, United Arab Emirates neither. And so I think that this, uh, of course, is not a mistake. Uh, well, it's an economic mistake, but it's not a political mistake, because it's, I think it's intended to include the area in the broader narrative of China becoming the leader of developing nations, wanting to help them develop their own internet, health, uh, financial, uh, transport and digital infrastructure also have us. So all the networks of connectivity of the future are included in the development, say, cooperation, and uh, including uh, countries which are not developing countries, but are high income countries or middle income countries. So I think that this narrative is very powerful. It's being sold to developing countries, of course, very effectively. We have seen 
how many you know partners and friends uh, China's been gathering around the really least developed countries, and how much China's foreign lending has been growing in these uh, least developed countries. Uh, but also for an era like you know the GCC or the Middle East altogether, but the GCC more specifically being included in the narrative of developing countries, I would inquire about at least myself. So I throw on the floor for the discussion this very point because I think that narratives are shaping our time. Of course, we are entrapped into two different narratives, very confrontational. We have a Washington narrative and Beijing narrative. I would very much hope that there's another narrative around and I hope that all these discussions can help build another one, maybe more quiet. Thank you for this. Thank you very much, Alessia. We will see now from the floor uh, what our public is going to ask us. I see already several questions and raise it. And please raise your digital end and then you will be invited to unmute yourself. As you mentioned, and as basically all our four speakers mentioned, the connectivity and different dimension of the BRI are playing uh, in the Gulf right now, but also as Alessia you're mentioning about two competing narrative, what I see as a gloomy picture looking, gazing at the crystal ball, is this uh, separation, uh, decoupling of digital ecosystem. Then it's going to be a huge problem, not only for global business, but for every individual. Having said that, uh, I just open the floor to the question. Uh, we have a hand from Hatun Alfassi. Uh, please just uh, unmute yourself and ask your question. Thank you. And I invite all the other speakers to just turn on the, the webcam so we are all on the panel. Okay. Hatun, the floor is yours if you want to ask a question. In the meantime, uh, if there are some technical issue, I just read the question. That, oh, please. Can you hear me? Perfectly, the floor is yours. Uh, okay, okay, sorry for that. Um, thank you for this interesting uh, panel. Um, my question is to uh, Jackie. Thank you, uh, Jackie, for this um, fascinating presentation. Uh, my question is regarding um, um, an absent element of the uh, Chinese uh, Gulf relations, if, if we would uh, call it uh, as such, which is uh, the Uyghur uh, minority, in, uh, the Muslim minority in, uh, in China. And uh, we know that uh, there are uh, very hard issues uh, uh, of the Uyghurs with the Chinese uh, state, uh, government, but we don't see that reflected by any means or any way in the in their relationship with the, with the Gulf. So I was wondering, why is that, and um, is there something else to that to the story? Um, is there a role that they should play in uh, in, in these relations? Um, and um, I'll leave it to you, Jackie, to, to enlighten, us, enlighten us with this uh, issue. Unfortunately, there really isn't too much um, to enlighten anybody on this issue. It is so sensitive that literally, as you've pointed out, there is no government in the Gulf um, willing to publicly at least um, question China about what's going on in Xinjiang. Um, and as somebody based in China right now, I am I'm not going to discuss um, what's happening in, in Xinjiang. And I don't see, um, and then when, when, I mean, I think obviously there are countries that speak out for, you know, for good reason. And then there are countries who speak out for reasons that feeds into Chinese nationalism. So it is, it is so sensitive that I don't see, unfortunately, any progress being made on this issue anytime soon. Um, and I honestly can't think of any, any particular government in the world, um, which is 
try to address this in a way that actually might be effective. Thank you, Jacqueline. And I'm just moving to another question that we just received now in the Q&A. It's a very specific question, and it's from Alexander Karapiteris. Uh, please, can you elaborate further from Qatar talk to make Chinese firm PetroChina and Sinopec equity stake partner in its liquefied natural gas expansion project? Can we consider that as a shift of Qatari reliance on Western measure for technology and global outreach? If someone of the can address the question. I'm, I'm happy to address it in a general sense, uh, and maybe someone else might, might want to come in uh, um, uh, on that as well. I can't speak to this very specific case, but what I can speak to is a broader trend uh, of uh, um, um, the way that the Gulf states have attempted to secure their market share in and to defend their market share in key uh, 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 markets and in key economies uh, as far as their energy exports are concerned. Uh, and so the, I think the underlying logic, and that, that tells you quite a bit about uh, um, the, the sense of uh, Saudi and Marathi investments, not only in, in China, but also in India and other major Asian markets that buy their energy exports, is that these are a way of locking in these buyer-seller seller relationships for the long term, uh, especially in, a, in an environment that is characterized by a, a, a glut in global uh, energy supplies and shortages and global energy demands, partly due to the slowing economic activity, uh, uh, which in part has been uh, uh, worsened by the, the global COVID-19 pandemic. So I think it's, 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 not, it's not a new thing uh, to bring in for the Gulf states to bring in Asian investors into their energy projects. The UAE has done it with uh, ONGC uh, Videsh, for example, an Indian uh, state-owned uh, uh, oil company. The Iranians have tried to do it as well. Uh, for the most part, these um, companies are brought in through joint ventures and so on without the Gulf states, because there still is a degree of resource nationalism. Uh, so the Gulf states are not, you know, ceding control or ownership of, for the most part, although Bahrain seems to be uh, uh, changing its policy somewhat, that there are indications that Bahrain might start offering ownership of oil in the ground uh, and of shale oil, shale oil in the ground uh, because of the difficulties in, in extracting shale oil. You know, you need to incentivize uh, 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 foreign investors to do that. Uh, but as a general rule, the Gulf states have not, to my knowledge, uh, um, uh, taken to con conceding or ceding ownership of the oil resources, even though they might uh, offer stakes in different uh, oil companies and so on. But this broader idea of bringing on Asian investors is not new. Uh, uh, and the, the underlying logic of, of much of the Gulf states' uh, uh, investment decisions has been to lock in these buyer-seller relationships for the long term so as to defend their market share, uh, uh, as I said, in an environment characterized by uh, um, oversupply in energy. I'll just say a few words uh, 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 to respond to, to Hatun's, I think, very interesting uh, question as well, if I may. Um, I think the, so, so the Gulf states have not been entirely silent about the Uyghur issue. Uh, we've seen statements by the Kuwaiti parliament, we've seen statements that by, by parliament in Bahrain. Uh, and uh, funny enough, the statement by the Bahraini parliament was actually immediately picked up by the US Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo at the time, uh, who tweeted it and said, you know, yes, there is resistance uh, uh, to, uh, to China and, and there's condemnation of what China is doing. Uh, even though it wasn't the, the, the Bahraini statement was not uh, framed in, in so uh, in very aggressive terms. Uh, but I think the, 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 the point, the takeaway point is that I think there has been a shift in the foreign policy strategies of the Gulf states, and particularly Saudi Arabia, away from championing transnational Muslim causes. So Saudi Arabia no longer, I think, under the leadership of Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman no longer sees itself, no longer is, is, not, is no longer very interested in playing the role of global champion of transnational Muslim causes. Uh, and so it's not going to ruin its relationship with China over the Uyghur issue or with India over uh, Kashmir or over the treatment of uh, 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 Muslim minorities in India. I think this is a broader trend that speaks to a, a broader shift in the foreign policy strategies 
of Gulf states. I think they're, they're, they're more interested, especially the, the UAE and Saudi Arabia are more interested in acting as, and, and Saudi Arabia, of course, as a G20 power, as important regional normal states, so to speak, than to play the role of a, a champion of, of transnational Muslim causes. I think we're seeing that shift. Uh, it's, it's not a very easy one because it means that you leave vacuums here and there for other players such as Turkey, for example, to, to fill in or, or uh, uh, as far as Kashmir is concerned. But even a, a player like Turkey, which has more compelling domestic political reasons to express sympathy with the, with the plight of Uyghur Muslims in China, finds it very difficult to do so because of uh, 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 what China is able to do in terms of the BRI, because of the economic incentives that exist in the Chinese relationship, because of China's, uh, 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 let's say, readiness to inflict pain on those uh, who dare cross the, 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 the three Chinese red lines, uh, uh, being, you know, Xinjiang and, 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 uh, and the domestic uh, issues being, being one of them, not to mention Hong Kong and, and Taiwan. Um, and I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Hassan. I have other couple of questions from uh, from the floor. I will try to merge both questions. Is uh, the recent violence uh, uh, erupted uh, uh, between Israel and Hamas? Uh, is it going uh, to create a problem for the future for the future of the Abraham Accord? And how uh, China or if China is going to play a role as a mediator? And this is open to all our speaker. Jonathan, if you want to start to jump in. Sure. So, yeah, when, when Wang Yi was in uh, Neom meeting with uh, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, back in March, he had made a, a statement that China was willing to meet with, now how did he phrase it? It was an interesting turn of phrase. I think it was just public figures from Palestine and Israel. So he didn't specify officials, but it was public figures. Um, to invite them to China to, to try to initiate some kind of talks on Israel and Palestine. Um, this is interesting for a couple of reasons. One, because it was held, I think, the day after the last round of um, elections in Israel. So nobody's paying any attention. Um, it just seemed like, you know, an, a, a low hanging, a piece of low hanging fruit. And I think in this, China was trying to, to offer itself as an alternative, you know, where, where the US was clearly um, aligned with, with Israel, where under the Trump administration, the Palestinians had really been given short shrift. And China has always portrayed itself as a leader of the global south of the third world. And to this end, Palestine has always been an issue that, that Chinese leaders have, have kind of clung to in the Middle East as a way of developing support in the Arab world. Um, this is good for a couple of reasons, but one maybe cynical reason is that the Arab world has a lot of voices and in the United Nations or other um, global forums. So by, by um, speaking to Arab publics in, in this way, it, it certainly endears China um, to, to a lot of countries that can help it in multilateral forums. Um, but at the same time, if you look at everything China does with Israel and Palestine, it's clearly uh, economically weighed much more heavily towards the Israelis than the Palestinians where China is doing a lot of investment, as Hassan mentioned, um, there's a lot of technology transfer, they're working on, on COVID and AI stuff. Um, the economic footprint with the Palestinians is basically selling a lot of consumer goods and essentially choking the Palestinian economy. So, you know, I think it's, it's a little disingenuous for, for China to portray itself as a, as a mediator in this issue. For, for one reason, I don't think anybody in Palestine or Israel sees China as a serious, um, well, as a serious actor in this. You know, they don't really have a, a history there. They don't have uh, a, a deep pool of, of diplomatic actors that can talk to both sides. This isn't something China really can, can do. And they've made this offer many times in the past and uh, nobody's really taken it very seriously. Um, as to the Abraham Accords, I, I don't think it's going to really have a, a fundamental impact. Um, I think everybody probably was expecting something like this to happen. Um, it's unfortunately a pretty common feature in the Israeli-Palestinian relationship. Um, I think all the Arab countries that have been engaging with Israel uh, did this with their eyes open. Um, 
I think the UAE obviously has has made statements that it, it sees an opportunity to play a role in some kind of solution at this point. So maybe um, rather than seeing it as something that might threaten the normalization, I think it's probably something that's, you know, I think it's probably seen as a, a, a bump in the road, a, a longer road. Thank you very much, Jonathan. And we have also another question from Iman El Alami, uh, considering uh, risk. Uh, Alami asks, uh, considering the instability and the Middle Eastern region, isn't that risky and challenging to the effectiveness of the BRI? Which measures are taken by China to cope with this unstable environment in order to promote its stability, which is essential to the success of the BRI? Alessia, if you want to answer this question. Yes, thank you. Uh, well, it is uh, an issue, but also a non-issue, depending on how we see and how we consider the Belt and Road. As far as transports are concerned, of course, uh, instability or energy, you know, uh, securing is uh, concerned. Instability is an issue. But as far as finance, digital and else, well, not so much so. So, um, and on top of that, all the other areas where the Belt and Road is uh, making inroads uh, are very unstable um, on various grounds. So I think that this question is very pertinent, of course, but um, the Belt and Roads are many and very diversified. Uh, so they can find their own way, you know, regardless of whether instability comes from some uh, field or another. And I think this is the very natural of how Baton Road was developed and designed from scratch. So not being linked too much to one avenue of connectivity, but building avenues many avenues for connectivity so that if one you know is bumpy then the other goes much faster so i think that yes and no are both right as an answer uh it's very complex not complicated but it's very complex networks of connectivity and uh, also the um, you know the immaterial avenues of connectivity are gaining importance exactly because most physical uh, connectivity um, links are maybe uh, cumbersome somewhere. Thank you, Alessia. We have still two raise a hand from Kedar and Yasser, but uh, first uh, let me see if uh, maybe Jonathan or Hassan, you want to jump in with a very quick remark. Sure, just very quickly on the BRI in the Middle East. I mean, sure, if you look at the Middle East as a whole, it does look like a, a region of turbulence or instability. But you will see pockets of stability. And again, uh, if you see places where China is investing, where it's developing ports or industrial parks, this seems to be the physical ar architecture of, of its Belt and Road in the region. And they've announced certain projects, you know, the Khalifa port here in Abu Dhabi, Dokkum and Oman, the Jazan Industrial Park in Saudi. Um, you know, all these things are kind of linking these business clusters and supply chains around the Arabian Peninsula to the Mediterranean. So. I think what, what China is doing is just targeting those areas where it's going to get the most bang for its buck, where it's going to be um, re, you know, havens of, of stability in a rather turbulent region. And uh, I think it's actually been, been a pretty sophisticated approach. Thank you very much, Jonathan. And we start for another question from the floor. Kader Neupane, apologies if I pronounce your family name. Uh, please be so kind to uh, unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I have a brief question because uh, as we see the Belt and Road now has a three or four dimensions. One is economics and the other one is a digital. As I hear from the speakers, uh, uh, in both areas, looks like China has made a lot of inroads in Asia, Africa, and now have entered into Middle East. And at the same time, uh, the, the human rights issues of Shenzhen was not a big agenda in the US policies in the past. Now the rhetoric has gone up. My question is, is it a new way by the West uh, to galvanize Muslim community to condemn China's interference or what is the strategy? Because it looks like they're losing on the economic and the digital. 
what is the gut feeling? I just wanted to have an, uh, anybody who panels can share us an idea. Thank you very much. The floor is yours if someone wants to jump in first. I'm happy to, to do so very quickly. I mean, I, I don't know if it's part of an explicit US strategy to galvanize um, global Muslim uh, condemnation of China, but uh, uh, I think it, if it were, it wouldn't be a very successful one. Uh, I think because most of the major, uh, so, you know, as we said, I mean, the Gulf states, uh, Saudi Arabia and the UAE, uh, are not interested in, in, in uh, ruining their relations with China on account of what they perceive and, and now frame as being a domestic, a Chinese, uh, nor, are, nor, nor are other countries like Pakistan, for example, uh, or Indonesia or other big players in the uh, organization of Islamic cooperation, big Muslim majority states, uh, interested or capable of playing such a role. I mean, Pakistan is a is a major uh, uh, recipient of Chinese investments and aid and lending. Uh, um, Indonesia and the big and, and the South Asian, uh, uh, Southeast Asian players uh, are also uh, uh, deeply have relations that are deeply intertwined with China. Uh, uh, Turkey, as we said, is also a, ma a major destination and, a ma and, a, and an important node in uh, the uh, in China's Belt and Road Initiative. And so, the, the, China has has created either by by default or by design. Uh, um, uh, uh, has managed to, to create uh, uh, deep founded, well-established relations with most of the big Muslim majority countries across the world. And I think the economic and the, and the security and the uh, 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 trade-off is too large for them, I think, to take a, a strong stand on uh, uh, what they view as uh, domestic, uh, uh, squarely Chinese uh, domestic issues. Thank you, Hassan, for your answer. And we have just the right time for the last question from the floor from Yasser al Kasemi. Yasser, if you want to unmute yourself and ask your question. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this interesting panel. I'd like uh, just to ask, um, uh, given that uh, China is ready to sell um, military drones and missiles uh, when United States or Europe hesitate providing this uh, sophisticated technology, I'd like uh, to ask if in the future we could uh, see uh, military Chinese uh, bases in the Gulf uh, as a strategy for the GCC to diversify allies and at the same time for China an opportunity to protect its uh, interests in the region above all the uh, oil tankers. Thank you. I think everybody can, can have a shot at this question uh, and we, we can start uh, with Jonathan, then Alessia, Hassan and Jacqueline. Sure, I'm actually, when we finish here, I'm going to get back to writing an article about this topic. So <laughs> I'll try to be brief, but it's gonna to be tough. I, I think on the one hand, it's reasonable to expect that with given the depth of China's interests and its expatriate population and the fact that tensions with China and the US kind of dictate that China can't rely on US providing security for Chinese interests in the long term. But at the same time, uh, the way I think Beijing would look at it is by trying to build a base, say in you know, Oman or, or wherever in the Gulf, this would be an overt challenge to, to US preponderance in the region. And you, know, you can say, as, as Hassan pointed out, a lot of countries do have uh, deeper footprints in the security realm. A lot of Asian countries do, but the difference is those countries are all US allies or partners, um, where China is the chief competitor. So I think Beijing's actually looked at this and thought the cost of antagonizing the US isn't worth it. And I think also the other calculation is knowing that, um, you know, if China were to go to the Saudis and say, hey, we want to build a base in Neom, then this would put the Saudis in a tremendously uh, difficult situation in their own relationship with you know, their, their main security partner. So I think for the time being, until, until the situation deteriorates between China and the US to the point where they can't, I imagine Beijing would be, would be far more satisfied to maintain the situation as, as it is, to not be overtly challenging US uh, preponderance in the region and um, using things like its, its uh, supply base in Djibouti and whatever Gwadar turns out to be in Pakistan as a way to 
project power in the region without having a, an actual base in the Gulf. Thanks. Alessia, if you have something to add. Yes. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, well, you know uh, that I'm not a security person at all. But uh, one thing I can say is that uh, the PLA has also, you know, um, used new tools of, say, aid, military aid and the diplomacy, so, so to say, during the COVID. There's been a lot of countries, especially in the area, uh, but also in Sub-Saharan Africa, Russia, Argentina, and many other countries, um, who received military aid and donations. So it's not exactly the standard traditional way of, you know, building um, or finding its own way in, in foreign countries, but it's a way to test, and, you know, the ability of building relations in a different way. This is a view from a non-security person about the donations the PLA uh, gave to many countries in during the pandemic and that may go on because it's the pandemic is not over uh we will have new versions of covid um and the network of donations will still be in place uh jacqueline if you want to add something and then we have hassan Yes, I, I do think that the PLA has carried out some military training. I mean, minor and very specific, but they have carried out some military training in the Gulf. And one thing now um, I'm interested in looking at is to see to what extent there have been specific scholarships set aside for people from the Gulf to attend um, various military universities um, in China. Asan, the floor is yours for uh, the closing remark. Thank you very much. I, I broadly agree. I don't uh, with, with with what Jonathan has has said, and and I think I, I like to look at the broader, the, the the really big trend. And I think the big trend is that uh, um, if the U.S. manages to set aside its differences with with Iran and and arrive at a some form of a you know, nuclear arms control agreement that builds on JCPOA 1.0, then I think really the 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 imperative for the U.S. to uh, um, remain focused on the Gulf is, is, is going to decrease. And I think over the long term, of course, uh, given the background of great power competition, uh, it's, it's most likely, and we're already seeing this in the national security strategies, not only of the US and, 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 the, and, the, and the biggest sort of global players, but, but even in uh, middle powers uh, strategies such as the UK uh, Defense Review, is that the Indo-Pacific is now becoming a, a much more important uh, theater of great power competition. Now, the question is, what are the implications of that for the Gulf states? And I think the way I, I tend to see this is that there are differential gains to be made by different Gulf states uh, uh, with great power competition, sort of shifting the spotlight onto the Indo-Pacific. So countries like Oman uh, uh, primarily because of its strategic location, but also Yemen, uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, because it straddled both the Gulf and the Red Sea and Yemen, so uh, pardon, and the UAE. In essence, really, the the uh, 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 the, the 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 IOR uh, uh, littoral states and, and the southern sort of Gulf states uh, are going to be the, the biggest beneficiaries of that shift uh, away from a focus on the Gulf uh, uh, and, and more to the Indian Ocean region. Now, China is not necessarily does not have a natural advantage uh, uh, geographically. India, for example, is is much better placed to dominate. Uh, 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 that part of it, not to dominate at least, but, but at least to, to play a more decisive security role uh, uh, in, that, in that zone. Um, but China has some advantages going for it. It's positioning itself as an important partner for the, for the Gulf states in areas of emerging technology. Uh, it manages to leverage its uh, economic capabilities in places like Djibouti uh, to acquire a strategic footprint. It's much more agile and dexterous than, than and, and, and its ability to formulate and implement policy than India, for example. Uh, and so it, it remains to be seen, but I think there are uh, differential gains and, and, and to be made from these big trends. Uh, I don't see China swooping in and, and, and overtly trying to uh, um, uh, uh, harass the US in the Gulf theater, primarily because it's 
you know, this is not going to be the main arena of, of the great power competition. It's, it's a bit more further to the south and, and, and to, the, to the east. And with this word, Hassan, please allow me to thank all our audience for being with us. We just run out just a few minutes later, but all the questions were very on point and informative and interesting. Uh, a great thanks to all our speakers for having devoted their time to be with us today. And uh, I hope you are going to have a great day. Thank you very much. And please, last but not least, allow me to thank the MEI and ESP Media team for making this event possible. Thank you and have a great day. Ciao.